Right, can we all see that? We can. Excellent, right. Okay. Right, well, thanks again, Mark. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Lorraine Lawrence. I'm from LJ Property Inspections Limited. We are a full service property inspection and report company. We cover various types of inspections, but today I'm going to focus on landlords and property and how to help protect your investment. Um, I'm going to lead the presentation uh, and John, my business partner, he'll be on standby for any questions at the end of the presentation or we can just pop them in the chat box as, as Mark as sort of says as we go along really. Um, just a quick, uh, uh, a little bit about what, uh, what we do. John and I set up in business at the beginning of last year. Uh, we both come from developer backgrounds and I have agency experience and we are uh, both landlords in the, in the private rented sector. Um, in last month's Ming meeting, Vanessa Warwick from Property Tribes uh, said something that uh, resonated with me actually and, and can easily be true when uh, being a landlord is not your primary role. She said, most small landlords are what I would say are in cure mode. So, does, so something goes wrong and they seek to cure it. Really, they need to get into prevention mode because we all know that prevention is less heartache, less emotional stress, less financial loss loss as a landlord ask yourself are you in cure mode or prevention mode here are some of the issues we face at the moment uh, as landlords uh, COVID-19 probably the biggest issue anyone has faced in our la lifetime rent arrears section 21 repairs and maintenance government legislation voids and disp deposit disputes and in addition to all of this the government states that tenants have a right to a decent, warm and safe place to live. It's in the best interest of both tenants and landlords to ensure that properties are kept in good repair and free from hazards. So, how do we get into prevention mode? Stop being reactive and become proactive. Right, here's the key points to think about. Make sure your property is up to date and complies with government legislation. Remember, you can't serve a Section 21 notice if you haven't given your tenant a copy of the gas safe certificate, EPC or how to rent guide before they move in. Keep a log of expiry dates and renewals so that you can book your services and inspections in in good time. Make sure you understand your tenancy agreement and there's nothing in there to contravene the Tenant Fees Act. Have a detailed inventory carried out at the start of the tenancy. Include details of anything that has already damaged or worn and make sure it refers to cleanliness of the property. This can catch us out a little bit. If items are brand new at the start of the tenancy, keep your receipts with the inventory. You may need those in the, in the event of a dispute at the end of the tenancy. Make sure that your tenant agrees with the contents of the inventory. If all parties agree with the report, there will be less ambiguity at the end of the tenancy when your tenants want their deposit back. Provide your tenant with information sheets. You may or may not, the uh, agent may not do this already. You should give them an end of tenancy information sheet at the start of their tenancy, detailing how they're expected to return the property at the end of the tenancy. And when they give notice, send it back to them again with a copy of the inventory for reference. Check in on your tenants regularly to keep communication channels open. This is an opportunity to build on a relationship with your tenant. If they're comfortable talking to you as a landlord or agent, they are more likely to mention minor issues, which may not be a problem for them, but could turn into a problem for you in the future. So would you rather get it looked at now or in 12 months time? Carry out periodic visits during the tenancy. This is where you can start to build a good picture of the condition of, the, of your property and also see how your tenant is looking after the property. And keep a log of communication so that you can refer to it in the future. Perhaps you've agreed a payment plan with your tenant because of COVID-19 or you've given them permission to have a pet. A checkout report relies on a robust inventory carried out at the start of the tenancy. Used in conjunction with inventory, it will clearly show changes in condition cleanliness and damage since the start of the tenancy. 
As a landlord, you will need to demonstrate that claims for any damages at the end of the tenancy are justified. By building a detailed picture of the property condition and tenant behaviour throughout the tenancy, you can start to see issues arising and head them off at the pass. So, to recap, what are the benefits of being a pro proactive as a landlord? Keep your property up to date with government regulations. Keeps it safe and free from hazards. As a landlord, you have a responsibility to make sure that homes are fit for human habitation. Regular maintenance throughout the tenancy is more likely to reduce costly repair bills at the end of the tenancy and shorten the periods between lets. And by being proactive in all of the areas, it will minimise the likelihood of a deposit dispute at the end of the tenancy. And what about the benefits of being proactive for your tenants? Well, good communication from the start and throughout the tenancy creates better relationships between all parties. And because the property is up to date with legislation and the property maintenance is carried out regularly, the tenant will feel safe, secure and happier. And your tenants will want to stay longer in the property and are more likely to look after the property and treat it as their home. So I'd add a case study to the presentation. I took this one from my deposits website. Cleaning is one of the most common issues we face as landlords at the end of a tenancy. The amount of the deposit is £900 and the amount in the dispute was £237.50. So what happened? The tenant said the property wasn't cleaned to a professional standard when they moved in, but had left the property to the clean to the same standard as at the start of the tenancy. They also said that the landlord's claim for cleaning amounted to betterment. And as a checkout report, report was far more detailed than the inventory and as an accurate comparison couldn't be made, it was unfair to make a charge. The agent responded by saying, well, only a, number, only a small number of areas were noted as not cleaning the inventory at the start and no amendments had been made by the tenant. And the checkout report showed there were far more areas left in need of cleaning. So what, what, was, what evidence did they provide? The landlord provided invoices, tenancy agreement, emails, an inventory dated May 17, supported by numerous photographs and checkout report dated September 19, and both reports were independent. So the points taken from the evidence the inventory carried out at the start of the tenancy showed the property was generally clean to a good standard, except where it had been noted specifically. The evidence didn't show that the property had been cleaned to professional standard at the start of the tenancy. The checkout report showed the property was left to a poor, clean to a poor standard with many areas and items needing a clean. The report did, however, include good quality photographs to help assess the difference in the standard of cleaning. The landlord employed a specialist cleaning contractor, which gave a breakdown of the areas cleaned, including the oven. As a result, the tenant was found responsible for £125 towards the cleaning. The adjudicator had had to consider the amount of cleaning that the tenant was responsible for to return the property to the same standard when they moved in and to avoid betterment. So just because he'd had it cleaned to a professional standard didn't mean that the landlord was entitled to the full amount. It was only to be compared as to the cleanliness at the start of the tenancy. So what can we take from this case to avoid this happening in the future? The standard of cleaning a property needs to be descriptive for each area with good quality photographs to support the decision. Tenants are responsible for leaving the property clean to the same standard as it was when they moved in, no matter how long the tenancy was. Remember, fair wear and tear does not apply to cleaning. Be aware that betterment can apply to cleaning. And while a landlord can choose to have their property clean to a higher standard than it was when the tenancy began, the only cost that can be passed to the tenant is in proportion to the difference in cleaning from start to end in each area and not necessarily the whole property. It's never too late to get into prevention mode. This is a perfect time to review your portfolio. Ignorance is bliss, but it could cost you more heartache, stress and financial loss in the long run if you don't pause for a moment and take stock. 
If you didn't have a detailed inventory carried out at the start of the tenancy, there is no reason why you couldn't instruct your agent to carry out a more detailed mid-term inspection to capture an image, better picture of, of its current condition. Uh, just bear in mind though, um, you can't access property at the moment if your tenant is self-isolating or shielding due to COVID-19. But if you can't get in, you could use remote reporting instead. Um, before I finish, I thought I'd just mention a quick few, uh, a few things about what's coming up the line in the private rented sector. The pre-action protocol on possession proceedings is already in place for social landlords. It looks like it, it, so it looks to help all parties to work through issues before taking action through the courts. The government is now looking to extend the current pre-action protocol to the private rented sector. So it'll encourage landlords and tenants to work together to agree an affordable rent repayment plan if their tenant falls into rent arrears. In preparation for this, Hamilton and Frozen have already launched a mediation service to help landlords and uh, help landlords with rent arrears. The domestic minimum energy efficiency standards, the mouthful, MEES regulations, set a minimum efficiency level for domestic private rented properties. Uh, since April 20, landlords can no longer let or continue to let properties covered by MEES regulations if they have an EPC rating below E, unless they have a valid exemption certificate. I recently listened to um, an NRLA webinar suggesting that the minimum levels will be increasing to accommodate the government's commitment to reducing carbon emissions. This will be more of a challenge for older properties, but hopefully there may be some uh, support available when we get there. New regulations uh, require landlords to have electrical installations in their properties inspected and tested by a qualified and competent person at least every five years. Landlords have to provide a copy of the electrical certificate report to their tenants and to the local authority if, requ if requested. Uh, the regulations to new tenancies apply from the 1st of July this year, but existing tenancies from April next year. Property passport popped up in the media a couple of weeks ago. Um, it suggested that where cars have MOTs, rental properties will have a unique property reference number, and any potential client will be a tenant rather will be able to see at the glance whether a property is compliant. And finally, licensing. Will more and more councils introduce licensing schemes? They're not just for HMOs. Licensing allows councils to make compulsory for every private rented property in a specified area to have a license. Plenty of councils are clamping down on rogue landlords. If you've got properties in different areas, it may be worth checking with your local council, although your agent should know. 